So welcome everybody to this event this evening, Financing Social Care, which is part of the LSE Festival on how do we get to a post-COVID world. And you're very welcome here uh, in person in the audience and also online. This is a hybrid event. Um, it will be recorded and all being well also available as a podcast uh, in due course. For that reason, please make sure that your phones are on silent uh, so that we're not disturbed during the event. Thank you. Uh, my name's Tanya Berhardt and I'm chairing this evening. I'm an associate director in the Centre for Analysis of Social Exclusion here at LSE and particularly pleased to be uh, chairing the event this evening because the issue of social care is very close to my heart and, and my research interests. As part of the Social Policies and Distributional Outcomes Programme funded by the Nuffield Foundation, I've been examining social care spending in England, as well as the policies that have been pursued over the last 10 years or so, and the outcomes uh, for those who either do or do not receive the care that they might need. So I'm acutely aware of the challenges in financing social care and also in delivering uh, the social care that's needed. Um, and those are the two themes that we're going to focus on in uh, this evening's event. As many of you will know, the whole issue of uh, adult social care has been a political hot potato uh, since at least 1999, when the Royal Commission on Long-Term Care reported. And there's been a sequence of proposals, commissions, reforms, proposed, sometimes not implemented, uh, over the following 20 plus years. Now, most recently, we had the Care Act 2014 uh, that enacted some of the proposals um, of the previous Dilnock Commission. I'm delighted to have Andrew Dilnock as part of the panel this evening. Uh, but those were not then implemented. And it took until last year uh, for the government to announce reforms that in some way resemble some parts of uh, what uh, the Andrew has recommended in that commission back in 2011. I'm sure we'll, we'll hear more about that in due course. The proposal uh, last year was for a national insurance contributions increase in order to pay for uh, reforms to social care. Uh, and that's one of the things that we'll be discussing tonight, whether national insurance contributions are indeed uh, the best way to finance uh, the reform that everyone agrees is needed in uh, adult social care. Uh, is it the best way to, to raise that revenue? Uh, what will that revenue achieve in practice? And does it tackle the most urgent problems will be amongst the other questions I think we'll discuss. Before I properly introduce our very distinguished panel, let me just say a few words about how the event will proceed this evening. We're going to first uh, launch a poll for the online audience. Um, you could launch the poll now if you'd like, uh, which is asking for your opinion about uh, which of the main possible revenue streams, it should be the main way in which additional revenue is funded for, uh, is provided for adult social care, national insurance contributions, income tax, inheritance tax, other taxes, private insurance, or I don't think improvements need financing. For those of you in the room, don't worry, you will get a chance to have your say too, but this is uh, for our online audience for the, for the moment. Uh, we'll let that uh, uh, accumulate. Uh, and then I will also uh, launch the poll again at the end of the meeting to see whether in the light of the discussion that we have and, and contributions from the floor, uh, there has been any shift of opinion, uh, imbalance of opinion, uh, during the course of the event. We're going to have five minute presentations from each of our uh, members of our panel. We'll then have a question and answer session, uh, both online, you can find the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen there, um, and uh, in person simply by raising your hand. Um, but either uh, route, please remember to say who you are and give your affiliation and keep your questions short. Uh, and then we'll finish with some final reflections from the panel and, and another poll. If you're a Twitter user, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Festival, um, and please feel free to, to tweet. So we have the results there of our poll, 
uh, and we can uh, still still some uh, answers coming in, but uh, I can see there that income tax is the currently the leading uh, uh, most favoured uh, route, followed by pretty even distribution between national insurance contributions, inheritance tax, and other taxes with very little support for private insurance. And I'm in a way relieved to see that we don't have anybody in the audience thinking that uh, no improvements uh, are necessary or the improvements are in financing. So without more ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, which is uh, Michelle Dyson. Uh, Michelle has had a sequence of senior roles at the Department of Education and the Department for Work and Pensions. And she's now Director General of Adult Social Care in the Department for Health and Social Care. So Michelle isn't just thinking and uh, commenting on adult social care as myself and perhaps Nick do, um, but is actually implementing it. So we're delighted to hear from you today. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Is this working? Yeah, brilliant. So look, I want to start by talking about what is social care, because it's not always obvious. Um, all of us have had experience of the NHS, but not everybody has had experience of social care. People tend to equate uh, social care with older people's care homes, but social care is much wider than that. It also supports people in their own homes, and it supports to adults of all ages, including working age adults typically with learning uh, disabilities. In fact, local authorities spend more on working age adults than they do on older people. Social care also covers unpaid carers, usually family members caring for a relative. Estimates of the numbers of unpaid carers uh, vary, but definitely above 5 million. Social care is like the NHS in having a very large workforce. Around 1.5 million people are working in social care. But it's unlike the NHS in that it's generally not free at the point of use. It's heavily means tested. And that's something that can come as a real shock to people who need to use it in a crisis. A lot of people think that it is free. Um, so in that way, it is in fact more like a benefit than a public service. It's also not a national service, unlike the NHS. It's run through local authorities who commission from about 18,000 small, uh, or many small uh, private sector uh, providers. So what are the, I mean, everyone says there are big problems in social care. What are the problems in social care? There are two very different sets of problems uh, in social care. First, there are the issues that arise in terms of who pays for social care. So if you get cancer, your care is paid for by the NHS. If you get dementia, you may spend years in a care home and you might have to spend nearly all your assets on that care. One in seven people face costs of over £100,000. This is the problem, the catastrophic costs problem that the government asked Andrew uh, Dilnot to look at in uh, 2011. Secondly, and separately, there are the issues with the social care system itself, regardless of who pays for it. You know, people talk about the problems of social care being laid bare by the pandemic. And stark evidence in this respect is that over a third of care workers leave their jobs every year. Um, so what are we doing about it? Well, we've published a 10 year vision that seeks to address both these problems. And we have 5.4 billion pounds over the next three years from the health and care levy for the next stages, for the first stages of this reform. Worth saying this is money for reform, it is separate and on top of the core funding for social care. Now others on this panel are going to debate the merits of how uh, the money has been raised, but I want to talk about how we're actually going to spend it. So on the catastrophic costs issue, the fairness to individuals on how much they have to pay, we are implementing Andrew's report. We have said that from October uh, 2023, we will lift the means test very significantly, so many more people will get state support. Also, and most innovatively, we are putting a cap on social care costs. So whatever your means, you will never have to spend more than £86,000 on your personal care. It will take time for the cost of all of this to ramp up, but by 2027, this will cost £3.7 billion a year in steady state. Um, so we are making state support for social care considerably more generous, but still nowhere near a completely free service like the NHS. 
there are really, and I just mention as I go, very significant delivery challenges with these proposals. We're going to be bringing in 150,000 extra people into uh, the state funded system. Each of these people will need to be assessed. That has big workforce implications. And we're going to need new technology in every local authority to track their progress towards the £86,000 cap. And then on the second issue, the social care system itself, we're investing extensively over the next three years with a view to addressing the fundamental issues and boosting productivity in what is undoubtedly a really fragile market. So for example, we're investing to support care providers to use digital care records. That sounds really basic stuff, but more than half are still using paper. Our biggest investment, 500 million, is going into the workforce. The care workforce is a professional workforce. The level of expertise and responsibility of your average care worker is really significant, but there is no external validation of this. So as well as providing lots of training, we will create a set of recognised qualifications and career paths and end the current position where every employer trains a new employee from scratch because they have no way of validating previous training and experience. So I could go on, but I think this is a good place to stop because actually the workforce is everything in social care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's great to start with a really clear understanding of what it is that we're actually talking about, um, which is, is so often so often nothing in, in debates on social care. Our next speaker is Andrew Dilnut, who is warden of Nuffield College in Oxford. He was previously chair of the UK Statistics Authority and, as we've already referred to, chair of the Commission on the Funding of Care and Support, which reported in 2011. And I think it's fair to say has really set the policy debate, the terms of the policy uh, agenda since then. Um, Andrew, you described the social care system once as confusing, unfair and unsustainable. And I'm wondering whether you think there's any prospect of... <laughs> uh, some. Some is the answer. Um, so I'll try to be as brief as I can. Um, as Michelle said, there are, there are two separate sets of issues here, even if we're only talking about uh, care of the elderly. And I'll mainly talk about care of the elderly. I actually think that the problems that remain for social care for those of working age are have, simply haven't been tackled and are very, very serious indeed. But for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to talk about that now. They may come up later. Um, so one question is who should pay? Should the state pay or should the individual pay? And it seems to me that as far as means tested support is concerned, well, almost by definition, that's blindingly bleed and obvious. So the state needs to pay for the social care for those who can't afford it for themselves. That is obvious. There's a big issue here because I think there's a strong case to be made for saying that we're not putting enough money in to provide adequate care for those who simply can't afford to pay for it themselves. But I think all would accept that if to the extent that we're providing care to those who can't afford any support for themselves, the state should pay. Then the more interesting question becomes, well, why should the state do anything more than that? Why should the state be interested in supporting the social care costs of the better off part of the population in the way that it does in the case of healthcare? In the case of healthcare, we, we support everybody. We have a universal system. Why should we move in that direction here? I think it's worth dwelling a bit on this. Uh, it, it's some simple but very, very important economics, which is not, I think, universally understood. And the core point is nobody would ever say to you, you should save up enough so that if your house burns down or you have a car crash, you can buy a new house or a new car. We pool that risk. It's a form of insurance. Insurance is an astonishingly sensible thing where there is a small probability of a large cost. And that is exactly where we are in social care for the elderly. So this is an insurance problem for the better off. You might then say, well, why on earth is the state got to be involved? We have private insurance industries. Why can't we get the private insurance industry to do that? And the answer to that is it simply can't and won't. Nowhere in the world is there a private insurance market for the catastrophic risk for social care. And there are technical reasons to do with that to, that are largely to do with what's called an aggregate shock risk. Put bluntly, if you're an insurer, you've got no idea what the cost of providing uh, elderly care to people in 20, 30 or 40 years time. There's a, there's a significant chance of technological change that radically increases the number of people who are alive or 
the cost of their care. So you simply will not provide that cover. And, and the, the, the truth of that statement, I think, is seen in the fact there isn't private insurance anywhere in the world. The only entity that can, that can ensure this catastrophic risk is the state. And that's why the state, in my view, has to be involved and why the steps that are being taken now are so important. That doesn't mean the state must provide for all. It just means that the state must take the catastrophic risk. There's still a significant scope for, for private individuals to contribute out of their own funds, but the state must take the catastrophic risk. How should we pay for this? Well, the means tested benefit element of it seems to me it's again blindingly obvious that should be paid for out of general taxation. Uh, it's a part of our redistributional policy. It's a part of being a humane society where we look after those who can't look after themselves. I don't think there's any argument for a special levy for a means tested support. What about the insurance element? Well, I think there are two questions. The first is who should pay? Uh, young people, poor people, rich people, old people. And the second is, uh, and what types of income should we tax? And then there's a second subsequent question, which is which tax should we use? So the, the first question, who should pay? Well, my own sense here is that everybody should pay. This is a classic social insurance uh, opportunity. And so the whole, of, the whole of the population should pay according to their ability. And in particular, older people should be making contributions. 70 years ago, old age and poverty were almost synonymous. Now the distribution of income amongst the elderly looks very, very like the distribution of income amongst those of working age. There's no argument anymore for excluding older people from making contributions to these kinds of social insurance regimes. And on what sorts of income, I think it's very important that all forms of income should be taxed. Uh, the, Again, for historical reasons, national insurance contributions in the UK have historically taxed earnings, but not investment income. And uh, I think it's important that all forms of income should be covered. The easiest taxes to use to pay for this would be either income tax or VAT. That's because they're widespread, wide base, uh, well administered. Uh, they cover all forms of either expenditure or income. What's been done is not been to use income tax, which would be probably the most natural thing, but to use an adapted form of national insurance contributions. I suspect there's not much difference between the members of the panel this evening. Simply having used the existing structure of national insurance contributions would have been difficult to defend because it would have meant that older people who don't pay national insurance contributions weren't paying. What's been proposed is an increase in national insurance contributions and for the first time a 1% levy within that structure on people over retirement age. Actually, that's a very good way of tackling a, a crazy uh, divergence from normality, from optimality in the tax system. That's a good thing. Uh, the, something has been done about the taxation and investment income, but not as much as might otherwise have been done. It's also worth perhaps just touching on a point that is sensitive for um, people like me who've thought about tax uh, I, was, I was at the IFS for 21 years. For, for people who are at the IFS, hypothecation is very nearly a dirty <laughs> word. And the reason that hypothecation is very nearly a dirty word is, is that in practice, it's never observed. You can only tell on day one that the increase in taxation has been spent in a way by, by year two. You've got no idea. You know, government revenue is a large amount of money. and Government spending is a large amount of money. Any linkage is tricky. But I've, I've grown more liberal minded about this in my old age. And I now think that having a tax with social care in its name, the health and social care levy, will almost certainly mean that the decades of, I think, close to scandalous underfunding of social care will be more difficult to persist with. And I also think, incidentally, the tax, this health and social care levy, by virtue of imposing uh, tax on pensioners that weren't taxed under national insurance contributions is likely to be one of the taxes that governments will be most inclined to raise when they need more money. And every time they do that, there will be some pressure to do that, which they've been very resistant to doing, which is put funding into social care. So despite my fiscal purist uncomfortable, uncomfortableness about hypothecation, it may turn out not to be such a bad thing. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. That was beautifully, beautifully clear, even for non-tax experts. Our, our next speaker is Nicholas McPherson, 
joined the House of Lords in 2016, having been permanent secretary to the Treasury from 2005 to 2016, outlasting, I think, three chancellors or spanning a period of, of three chancellors in, in that role. Um, Nicholas has written on the relative merits of national insurance and income tax and indeed other sources of finance for uh, health and social care. So we're very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much. And well, um, thank you for having me. It's great. It's great to be here. Funny enough, listening, a Andrew wouldn't tell us beforehand what he was going to say, but <laughs> listening to him, um, uh, actually, I don't think I, um, I agree with pretty much most of what he said. I mean, I'm just going to try and explain. I mean, I spent 31 years of my life in the Treasury, and I think sort of if you stay in an institution that long, it begins to just sort of inform your thinking. So I'm just going to set out some views from, from, from the perspective of a finance ministry. I mean, the first point I'd make is, look, we only got this funding problem uh, for social care because the economy has grown so slowly over the last um, 14 years or so since the financial crisis. I mean, an interesting thought experiment is what if we carried on growing since the crisis as we did before, and I just did done a quick back of uh, the envelope calculation. The GDP would be some 480 billion higher, and we'd have about 170 billion pounds more in revenue. Now, obviously, as a Treasury official, I'd want to use some of that to pay down the deficit, but um, I reckon there'd be more tons of money to pay for social care. Anyway, so I just encourage you to think of you know, what generates revenue, and that is economic activity. So uh, pursuing sensible, a sensible strategy to increase productivity <laughs> is clearly the answer. Having said that, my next port of call would be cutting public spending to pay for social care. Um, you know, being, being a typical Treasury official who knows the price <laughs> of everything and the value of nothing. Um, I was never keep, particularly keen to pay for Andrew's uh, proposals on catastrophic costs. And actually had some success in pushing pushing the can down the road for another 10 years, probably very unfairly on those affected. Um, but I just wonder whether, I mean, I totally accept his arguments and the, the principles, but um, I just wonder at a time when it's mm -hmm. social care which needs the money rather than um, certain households within society, that that is a sensible area to prioritise. Anyway, I, I, I move on. So I think... Um, I do just want to put cutting public spending on the agenda. We could um, abolish the triple lock. Um, we could uh, actually go for more radical reform of public services and so on. But uh, then you end up with tax. And um, just to be clear on the tax front, and it slightly reinforces Andrew's points, um, you can all fantasise about wealth taxes and inheritance tax. But I can tell you for free, those aren't going to happen. Um, well, inheritance taxes are any tax which involves someone writing a cheque at the end of a process um, is incredibly unpopular. And one of the strange things about inheritance taxes is very few households end up paying them. I mean, something like 650,000 people die a year. And I think only about 45,000 estates pay inheritance tax. But, but the problem is lots of people it's a sort of aspirational tax. Lots of people are convinced that their household is going to end up paying it. And so it's one of those taxes which is incredibly unpopular. Indeed, I'm quite surprised it's remained in existence at all. And wealth taxes, you only have to look at the various um, socialist governments in France, which have sought to introduce wealth taxes. By the time you've exempted your main home, um, lots of other things as well, um, they always bring in a pitfall amount of money, which is why, in the end, you've got to rely on big tax. And there are three big taxes, VAT, um, national insurance and income tax. I don't think uh, a consumption tax is appropriate. I think this needs to be based on income. And I mean, look, I, I, I don't mind whether it's national insurance or income tax. Um, you kind of got to get revenue where you can. I think it's a pity Governments are very reluctant to increase income tax because it's some great symbol. The result is in my lifetime, national insurance has gone up hugely, whereas income tax rates have been cut persistently. Um, so if you're gonna use national insurance because for some reason people 
allegedly um, find it slightly less painful paying it, you've got to reform it. Um, it's got to be paid by everybody. It's got to be paid on all income. As Andrew says, the elderly should not be um, let off. And, um, and so I think, you know, I'd give sort of two cheers to the government's approach. I think, you know, they've done broadly what I've argued for. I, I, I'm, I'm very irritated that rental income isn't charged. Her Majesty, who lives off huge amounts of rental income, is there, for example, from this levy, whereas uh, hard-working 25-year-olds like you um, who work around the clock to attend, um, to be able to afford to attend LSE lectures like this have to pay a whole lot. And as for hypothecation, I'm with Andrew. I mean, look, you have to get revenue where you can. If if the British people are going to be more likely to pay tax, if they if you can convince them that they're paying for social care so much, the better. What you don't want to do is have hard hypothecation. We tried that before the Second World War when it came to transport, and you get into terrible trouble with the cycle when you tend to run out of money when you need it most. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and just as a point of clarification, the LSE Festival is free and open to all. <laughs> Luckily, no one needed to, to, to go out and earn or pay national insurance contributions in order to attend STEM. I'm delighted to introduce now our final speaker, um, Professor Nicholas Barr, Professor of Public Economics in the European Institute here at the London School of Economics, who literally did write the book on the economics of the welfare state and about 20 or so other books besides and, and numerous articles. Uh, he's got wide ranging policy experience as well in the World Bank, in the International Monetary Fund, and as a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Democratic Shifts and on the Aging Society. Um, so a, a great wealth of experience across both academia and the world of policy uh, on funding for and financing for, for the welfare state. Over to you. I should say, by way of starting, that one of the lessons I learned at the World Bank was that strategic policy design, the sort of thing that academics like me do, is the easy bit. The hard bit is implementation. So raising the money is relatively straightforward, I'm going to argue. It's how you actually deliver the service that's the difficult bit. I want to make three points, but there's only one key point, and that echoes um, something that Andrew said, my soundbite is, it's insurance, stupid. People buy insurance to protect themselves against a bad thing that might happen to them or might not, and which the person can't stop happening to them, and if it does happen, is going to be expensive. And needing social care at some stage, perhaps many years in the future, is exactly a risk like that. So it's good if people can buy insurance against the costs of needing social care. That's my first point. Second point, but as Andrew has said, private insurance doesn't work well for social care. Now, this isn't the, 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 the right place for a lecture on the economics of insurance, but the basic point is very straightforward. The premium you pay for insurance is based on two things, the size of the loss you're insuring against, and the probability that the loss will occur. And in the case of losing your bag on a flight or having somebody shunt into your car, both the size of the loss and the probability are reasonably well known and insurers can price insurance uh, efficiently. With social care, very different. Um, what's the probability that you in your 20s are gonna need social care in 60 or 70 years time? It could be higher because medical advances will keep you alive longer in a dependent state, or it could be lower because medical advances will keep you healthy and active for longer. Will the costs be higher or lower? Well, they could be higher because services become more expensive, but they could be lower uh, if cheap robots can do some of the heavy lifting. So for both the probability and the size of the loss, not only do we not know what they're gonna be, we don't even know the direction of change. And in technical terms, the problem is not one of risk, it's one of uncertainty. And private insurance can't address uncertainty because um, insurers can't price policy sense. So that's my second point. Third point, take account of the wider context. Successful policy needs to be based on strategy 
the term is often abused. A strategy is a series of policies, all of which are mutually reinforcing. Um, think of the beverage um, strategy as being a good example. Too much policy design is piecemeal. So sort of one focuses tunnel vision on a particular policy. But to make it worse, even where politicians are presented with a strategy, they cherry pick. They do the bits that are politically popular. They leave out the rest. I bear the scars. Andrew probably bears even more scars than I do. So with that in mind, what's the strategy financing social care? The first element is a suitable case for national insurance, as the government announced last September. Those reforms are controversial, which is precisely why we're having this panel. In a paper I wrote 12 years ago, I made the point that there's powerful arguments for using national insurance contributions, in other words, social insurance. Um, first of all, it's an insurance problem. That was my first point. Secondly, the private market can't hack it, my second point. Social care can accommodate uncertainty because you can change tax rates and change the rules of the game uh, through parliamentary action. Um, and it also can adapt to changing medical and social circumstances. So you've got a much more flexible instrument because the contract doesn't have to be completely specified. So a strategy financing social care would have social insurance covering basic costs, both of residential care and care in the home. And a practical implementation of that is the system in Germany where they have an add-on to their social insurance contribution, and that pays for care both in the home and um, uh, in residential care. <clears throat> now, insurance, as Andrew said, is about insurance. It's not about distribution. So where does distribution come in? And um, I would argue that you do the insurance through social insurance. You then think about distribution not just in terms of the way national insurance operates, but in terms of a wider canvas. So you could raise the upper limit on national insurance contributions. You can and should make the social care addition cover not only pensioner earnings, but all of pensioner income, including the pension, which is the system in Germany. Um, and on a wider canvas, you can have action on child benefit and child tax credit. Uh, you can make income tax more progressive, as a theoretical proposition, but Nick McPherson has said, I'm living in dream world in saying this, one could have action on inheritance tax, but I'm not proposing that as a serious policy. So all this may sound naive, and I realize that government has limited bandwidth, but to close, remember two things. One, Beveridge based his recommendations on three background assumptions, family allowances, a national health service, and the maintenance of full employment. So you can think strategically. That's the first point. The second thing to bear in mind is piecemeal reform leads to the sort of mess we have in higher education finance at the moment, on which don't get me started. <laughs> I rest my case. Indeed, um, Nick. So um, we'll move now to the question and answer uh, part of the event. Um, whilst you're getting your questions together, um, I'm just going to return to the members of the panel to see if there is one single point that they might want to pick up on from uh, anything that they've heard so far. We've already got the questions coming in on the uh, online Q&A. That's great. So you can find the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Just pop your question in there with your name and affiliation. And for those of you in the room, have a think about what you might want to ask. And we've got a roving mic here, so just indicate and we'll get that to you. Um, but first, um, Michelle, was there anything that you heard that you wanted to come back on at all from the, from the panel? Just maximum of one point. I mean, the only point I would make is that, that it's been a sort of fascinating discussion about how you raise the money, um, but not a discussion about what are the problems that need fixing, which I guess is my, <laughs> the, the thing that, uh, that, that I worry about. Mm. Very good, thank you. Well, I hope we'll get some questions from the audience to take that part of the discussion forward as well. Andrew, anything you want to do? Well, there was sort of an embarrassing outbreak of consensus. I think the one, the one thing that I, so I agree with Nick wholeheartedly that 
economic growth, both real and nominal, is, is essential to our public consumption. That's certainly true. And if we had more economic growth in the last 14 years, uh, we'd have had more money that could have been spent on social care. What I'm not at all confident of is that it would have been. And the history of the last 30 or 40 years is that social care, for reasons that I think it does work, it, it merit dwelling on, just doesn't attract public attention. And I think it's, it's almost the kind of inverse of the premature baby problem. So, so if, you're, if you're raising funds for a hospital for premature child, for, for the care of premature children, that can be relatively straightforward. If you're looking to raise funds for social care, either for working age adults with social care needs or for older people, it's just not such, people don't find it an attractive thing. And generations have got, you know, I've been, Nick and I, I expect have worked, and well, the, both Nicks and I, worked on this for, in Nick Barr's case, more than 40 years, Nick, Nick first and Mike, 40. Throughout that period, social care has been a kind of somewhat orphaned area. And I think that is a critical part of why it's not been adequately funded. And so I don't, I th I don't think simply having the money around would mean that we're going to go to social care. I think we've got 40 years of experience that says that maybe not the case. Can I just say that I think things have changed a bit over the last few years and through the pandemic. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just going to pick up on the, on the pandemic because I do think um, you know, how we develop and pay our social care workforce and how, where we recruit it for the time of full employment, I think is a really interesting question. I actually want to make one very brief point, which because I completely failed to make it and nobody else did. Um, one reason why governments quite like national insurance is they get two taxes for the price of one uh, because employers uh, get taxed <laughs> effectively on their payroll. I think this is slightly dishonest. Um, the, I mean, I won't get into the economics of it. Actually, taxing employers, is, the economic effect is pretty much the same as taxing the employee, <laughs> but employers don't vote. I mean, well, generally they don't vote. Um, and so I think that's just a little bit sneaky. And um, I just wanted to flag it up. Let me just explain what I would die in a ditch for and what I wouldn't and urge you to adopt the same policy. I die in a ditch. It's not private insurance. That's the wrong mechanism. And it's not heavily um, means tested. What I'm not fussed about is whether it's financed through income tax implemented well or national insurance contributions implemented well. I mean, Andrew's proposals are based around income tax. If they were done properly, I wouldn't dream of opposing them. Great. Um, but I, I, I still think it's intuitively more plausible to people to have national insurance contributions. And a point that's been raised, having a dedicated revenue source as an empirical matter, I think is uh, less, it, it's got a bit more protection against budgetary crises. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, panel. So um, we've got, first of all, two questions from our online audience, which I'll uh, read out and then um, invite you to respond to. The first comes from Claire Shields, uh, who works in the Workforce Transformation NHS England Southwest region. And she says, my region has the age profile that the rest of the country will have in 20 years or so. What can we learn from how other countries with ageing populations have tackled the financing of social care. And uh, the second question comes from Louisa Fisk uh, from the finance business partner, who, who is a finance business partner at Essex County Council. And she asks, how can we justify the increases in social care when a huge chunk of our spending is actually on working age adults, as Michelle mentioned earlier? So um, those two questions for the panel, I'll perhaps come to you first. Andrew, and I don't know if you have any thoughts, particularly perhaps about other countries' ways of tackling this. So most 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 developed countries are worried about this, and many of them are trying to respond. Um, I don't think there's anywhere that feels they fa they've found the solution. Um, we see some countries, and I suppose Germany would be the most would be the clearest example, which have gone down a wholeheartedly. Uh, social insurance route that looks more like the National Health Service here, although not, not, not the same, it's not quite so universal. The, the, the challenge they're facing there is that costs are rising very quickly, and that means they're having to raise contribution, but also um, restrict benefits so that 
it simply isn't the case that all all care is being covered. But that's 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 one route that has worked. We, we see something a little bit similar in Japan. Australia has introduced reforms more like those that are being considered for implementation in the UK. But I think essentially what we see all around the world is people gr a growing awareness of the challenge. But no, I don't think yet anyone has found something that everybody wants to copy because it doesn't look as though everybody. Did. And of course, partly this is this is going to we are going to have to allocate more of our national income to this. And the central the central questions are what's the split between the state and the individual, and how do we get the best care? And critically, and Nick has talked about it a bit, how do we make this an industry where it's nice to work? Um, and, and I'm happy to talk about that more when the, I think the economics of, of the current system are particularly bad for the workforce. We have a system where almost everybody will want to buy the cheapest care that's available that meets the regulatory requirements. And that means they've got a, 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 a flat demand curve. There's no producer or consumer surplus available, very little investment, very little innovation and very, very low wages. So not only is the experience of receiving social care a challenge, but the experience of delivering it, either as an employer or as an employee, is pretty tough. And we've got to tackle all of that. And I don't think anywhere in the world has found a way out of that. Sorry, Martha. No, no, thanks. thanks, Andrew. That was great. I realised there was a part of the second question that I'd missed um, when I read it out, which is that Louise's point was not just that increases in uh, uh, our spending is actually on working age adults, but more specifically that insurance, the idea of insurance doesn't seem to apply as well uh, when we're thinking about people of working age as it does when we're thinking about insuring for old age. Well, if I can very quickly, I mean, I think it can, should, and I think the cap should simply be set at zero for anyone who enters working age with a pre-existing social care need. I think we should hide ourselves behind the rules and veil of ignorance and say, yes. what would we want the world to be like if it turned out that we were the child that was born with a significant need? And while it seems to be reasonable to say to people of our age, you should have allocated some of your earnings during your working life to look after yourself when you're old. To say to somebody who enters working adult, working age adulthood with a pre-existing social care need that they should have provided for themselves is almost, I mean, it's beyond belief, actually. Um, so it precisely is an insurance matter, but I think it's, it's an insurance where the risk should clearly be pulled across the whole of society and there shouldn't be any expectation of a contribution from the individual concerned. Nick, the person you were nodding there, was there anything you wanted to add on, on that? Uh, no, um, I'll, I mean, I'll take a few with Andrew. I do think um, it, it's your point about the sort of rules the veil of ignorance. Um, you've got to pay for it and you've got to pay for it out of... Um, you know, whether, whether you want to call it insurance or not, it needs to be paid for by the state. Just one point, I I do think, um, you know, looking at systems across Europe, it, it's tempting to think you should just nationalise all of this because, you know, then you could have um, any postcode lotteries that would be universal. I mean, the, the Treasury of Fishman may, may worries about nationalising it because I think it would become a lot more expensive. I mean, some of that would be because it was a better service. But I genuinely think that, um, especially elderly social care, kind of needs to be delivered in and reflect the local community. I mean, I'm, I don't have great scientific knowledge, but um, my father-in-law ended his days <laughs> in a care home in Austria. He couldn't speak any German, but um, that was um, his choice. And it was really strongly community-based and people just came in and visited their old folk. And it was really, it didn't smell of urine. It just was very different from the British equivalent. And you just felt the community owned it and, you know, in a sense was happy to fund it. So I do think there's sort of in Britain, there's always this temptation that, you know, you've got to have a quality of treatment, so it needs to be done by um, a national level, and that would worry me because um, generally the gentleman and um, gentlewoman in Whitehall doesn't know best. Can we just come in? Um, so I think there's an interesting experiment going on from our point of view anyway in Scotland, because Scotland has free personal care for everyone. 
But what has happened that I think what Andrew was dis describing before, which is although it's it is theoretically free in practice because there's not enough money to go around, in practice it's rationed. And Scotland is now moving to a national care service. Now, what that will mean again in practice remains to be to, to be seen. So lots of, but I think what we can learn actually from different nations within the UK is really interesting because they're all going down different routes of, on uh, social care. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah. Nick, any quick points before we come to the very patient audience in the room here? On working age adults, complete agreement, of course. Insurance covers everybody from the time they're born. No more need be said. In terms of local communities, I, I say this as somebody with no expertise at all. Having primary school children going into residential accommodation and interacting with older people, I've seen wonderful examples of that. What I don't know is how well it would scale up, but as an example of involving the local community, I think it's well worth investigating. On other countries, I mean, where all this started from was workers earn money and pensioners are poor. So, of course, the workers pay the contributions and the pensioners get the money. But the world has changed since then. Pensioners often have wealth. They often have income, both from a above the poverty line pension and often from continued earnings. So the idea that one should impose the, the, the insurance contributions either should be the same for older people as for workers, or maybe at a reduced rate, but that one should, that the essay question is, what should the tax base be for older people? And I think it should be very much wider than what the government has proposed. Thank you, Nick. Okay, so uh, to the room here, please just uh, raise your hand. Um, yeah, so, I, we'll have the microphone yeah. just so it Thank goes through onto the recording. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm an undergraduate student at the LSE, and I had a question regarding what you said about delivering it locally. Um, wouldn't that lead to sort of distributional issues of quality, just because depending on where the good is delivered, like with local public goods, I mean, the quality may suffer in some regions, whether it, whereas it may benefit in um, more high income areas, wouldn't that be a problem? Thank you. Okay, and um, I've seen this person here with the waistcoat. Thank you. I, I'm just a visitor to the LSE. Um, the point I want to make, or, or the, the question I want to put to them is that the, the crisis of social care and financing of social care is, it's not something that's suddenly happened. It's the result of profound demographic change in the country and in the society. Uh, coming back to the point you were making about strategy, though, to what extent should the strategy for financing social care take account of that demographic change in terms of um, people's attitudes towards insurance, people's attitudes towards wealth, people's attitudes. The voting population is getting older and older and older, and these are becoming more and more uh, pertinent to their interests. Um, I, I, I've sort of got the impression that one's tending to look at social change, I mean, social care as something that's just happened, in a world that has otherwise remained the same, this world is profoundly different because of the overall demographics. That's my question. Okay. Very much. And one on the back row there with a cap. <coughs> Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, firstly, uh, privatization does not mean some local. A uh, village will end up owning their um, care home. What it means is an American company will come in and take ownership and then put the cheapest wage in there possible for the cheapest services, which is reflected in the UK today. So that is a total disconnect from reality on that front. Um, I was a bit disturbed to hear that not mention of oil companies not paying for our social care who have fundamentally robbed our planet of its health and its future through pumping out oil constantly and destroying our environment the air we very breathe and now we need to care for because of our disabilities we get just from breathing the air we uh, 
we have to learn, do every single day, of course. So I'm amazed at the organizations and capitalism, which clearly are responsible for some particular horrors in our society, putting their money in tax havens. We're not targeting these people. Fundamentally, first, we target the people that have stolen our wealth and destroyed our planet. And then once that's done, we take their money and pay for it all. And then secondly, uh, and to, to make the elderly pay for it, that's one of the most disgusting things I've ever heard in my life. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'll, I'll think we'll take those three first, and then we'll uh, take some more online questions and some more from the room. I think we'll, we'll, we'll have time to put in two more rounds, probably. Um, Nick McPherson, would you like to start? So we've got the question about what would it actually yeah. mean delivering locally. We've got the yeah. question about demographic change. I think, look, I, think, I think it's a really fair question. I do think local authorities need to be funded um, Obviously, they, they, they raise taxes locally, but um, the national government has a key role in ensuring that, they, that their funding um, reflects their needs. Um, then I think, you know, in the case for um, the Department for Social Care, setting some fairly high level national standards and having a sort of care quality audit system to ensure that actually you know, particular areas aren't being um, given rotten services, but I just think you, you can't do this from Whitehall. It does need a local a local dimension. Um, I, I, I I liked your point. I think there's no coincidence that this issue, after 30 years of royal commissions and so on, is finally being tackled now. And it's because this baby boomer generation um, is um, becoming elderly. And they're beginning to think about this, and they've got voting power, and um, their influence, mainly because young people don't vote in such large numbers, is is huge. Um, and you know, I'd love to think that oil companies could pay for it, but Mr. Sunak appears to be getting oil companies to pay for um, your lower electricity bills this autumn. And I just, and I'd love to get money out of tax haven and spend much of my time at the treasury try to do that very occasionally you'd have a local success but the idea that there's you know income tax nationally trying to raise hundreds of billions with the best will in the world um you're not going to get hundreds of billions out of tax havens Michelle, I wondered if you wanted to come in on yeah. the, particularly on the local delivery perhaps. Yeah, I'll come in on the quiet side. Yeah. Well. yeah. Uh, so on the local delivery, uh, excellent point. Um, so just I'd make two points in response. First of all, in terms of the the ability to raise money locally, and obviously it's much easier for rich areas because a certain amount goes in through through national government, but an awful lot of social care is raised locally, so it is an issue, and we try and sort of adjust. For the fact that some areas find it more difficult to raise through business rates, etc. Um, Nick is right, though, the, the point about um, the divergence that you might get in quality, we're taking, we have taken new powers, in fact, this year in the Health and Care Act to regulate uh, what local government is up to. So at the moment, the Care Quality Commission only looks at what providers do to the care homes, etc. No one looks at what local government actually does. And so we've taken these new powers where we will be, uh, the Care Quality Commission will be looking at what uh, local government does, which will bring a whole load of transparency to what's going on and ability to sort of compare and contrast between different local authorities. So hopefully we will have that going forward. Um, I just wanted to come back on the point about uh, you know, everything's privatised. Um, it's true, I mean, most care provision is delivered through uh, private providers. And there's controversy to some degree about some of this private equity has moved into um, social care at, at, to, to some degree. Um, the, the only metric we have to look at this really is through the Care Quality Commission. And we find no difference in terms of what the Care Quality Commission tells us in terms of the quality of what the, that is delivered in homes that are in, owned through uh, private equity versus those that are owned through not-for-profit providers versus those that are owned through local authorities. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Nick. Um, very briefly on the quality point. Again, it's not my area of expertise, but I have seen this with my own eyes. A critical variable is the quality of the manager. 
get a crackerjack manager, everything's buzzing, it's all about the welfare of the residents. Get a tick box manager and morale can decline incredibly fast. So part of the quality assurance needs to look at that aspect. Um, on the demographic point, um, that's precisely why I think the tide is moving across countries that contributions are paid also by older people. I'm utterly un unrepentant about the point. The nature of age is changing. In my parents' or grandparents' time, someone of my age would be very, very old. Well, all I can say is I don't feel that. <laughs> Things have changed. And, you know, as a professor, my income is above the national average. That I should be exempt from this just seems to me inequitable as well as being inefficient. Um, on the oil companies, um, I said inheritance tax would be nice, but I'm told it's dream world. What I would love to see would be a carbon tax, which would be used to pay a carbon dividend, such as a universal basic income, but some of it could also be used to finance social care or the National Health Service. And it would have all sorts of efficiency advantages in terms of the price signals it gave for producing a healthier planet. Now, people have talked about the idea of universal basic services, in fact, haven't they, alongside yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. universal basic income, which yeah. social care would seem yeah, very yeah, good, yeah. Yeah. very good contender. And just two things very quickly on, on, on the demographics, um, just to give you some numbers, in 1901, according to the census in 1901, there were 61,000 people aged over 80 in the UK. <laughs> In 2011, that number was 1.447 million, and we expect it to be 3 million by 2030. So it is an extraordinary change, but it's been going on for a very, very long time. The aging of the population has been going on pretty steadily, particularly in the post-war period. And I'm, in a way, it's a reminder of how adaptable societies and economies are. We have not been um, terrorized by marauding gangs of hell's bannies as the number has gone from 61,000 to 3 million. Uh, you know, actually, we've adjusted very well in most areas. This is one area where we haven't adjusted well, and it's because the market completely fails to function, and that's why we need to intervene. Related to that, I've been guilty of it this evening, but we've all, I think, slipped into thinking about social care as something that's done to people, and that is done to people in residential care homes. And actually, the majority of social care isn't in residential care anymore, and we're moving radically away from that. And I think one of the things that we most would all want to do is move away from a notion that social care is something that's done to somebody towards a, a, an idea that social care is something that people consume to enhance their lives. Now, of course, there are cases, particularly cases of severe dementia, where you know, that, that, that the element of, of individual agency is necessarily lost. One of the things that I think is most wonderful in many social care settings is how good the care providers are at, at, at giving agency to people. And in the financing world, it's worth remembering that we have an extensive programme now of the government not imposing care on people, but giving them money with which to consume their own care. I think most of what I've been talking about is ways of trying to make those sorts of markets work better so that individuals and their families can consume the care they want. And one of the things that surprised us when personal independent payments started was how diverse the set of things that people wanted to use their funding for was. You know, it's sorry, enough. No, that's good. great. Thank, thank you very much, Andrew. So I'm going to take two more questions from our online audience and then come for a final round in the in the room. Um, so Parth Patel from IPPR asks, what policies could improve the social care labour market, both with regard to labour shortages and working conditions? I might come to you first on that, Michelle. Uh, and then Anthony, who's an uh, LSE alum, uh, asks, on raising tax, is the OECD-led deal on corporate tax rates a help or a hindrance? Could it be ratcheted up to raise more for social care, NHS and other public services? Or are there still too many ways to shift or hide in low tax jurisdictions? We might come to you first on that person. Uh, so Michelle first on the social care labour. <coughs> there's some bits of that. What, what policies could improve the social care labour market, both with regard to labour shortages and working conditions? Um, so 
labour shortages. Um, look, it's really difficult at the moment in social care because social care is in, in competition with all sorts of um, other parts of the, the low end of the labour market. And if you talk to social care providers, they will say, you know, Aldi and Lidl are willing to pay more than we can pay. And that, you know, this, you've got this problem across the whole of the, the labour market at the, at the moment. What, what can we do about it? Um, it, it's it's not easy. We have put uh, care workers onto the shortage occupation list. That's the list that enables uh, sort of, uh, immigration, and that seems to be proving quite uh, effective and quite popular. So that we did that in February. So we're only sort of starting to see the results uh, now. But so so that's one thing you can do. You can uh, you can do the immigration. I do think. I mean, the, the other point, as I said at the outset, is how how much turnover there is. In the social care labour market, people moving between employers. I mean, it's not just that they're going to Aldi or Lidl, they're also moving between uh, social care providers. But some have bucked the trend. Yeah, I think it's a, a, a quarter of uh, care providers keep their turnover down to about 10%, which is sort of a massive achievement. <coughs> How do they do it? They do it through the things that any good employer would know about, which is empowering their staff, thanking their staff, uh, valuing their staff providing training to their staff. And so, and I think what we can do at national level, we can certainly provide training, as I said at the outset, I think providing uh, qualifications that are recognized so people can see that they've got a, there is a, you know, unlike the NHS, which has got all these different levels, you can see your career pathway there. None of that exists in social care. I think if we can create that, 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 will, uh, that will really help. Um, I do think there is more recognition now of the care workforce than there was uh, a few years ago in 2019. I think it was that care workers first appeared on the Ipsos Mori Trust Index. They came above civil servants, I should say. But that was, you know, I think that's a real mark of how people are talking that the care workforce um, exists and what an important part it plays in society. And for people who, who love working with people, being a care worker uh, is amazing, an amazing thing to do. But none of which is to say that it's uh, it is easy. Well, thank you, Nick. On the OECD no, I mean, uh, if corporate tax, if um, you know, if it is, is is indeed fully implemented, it will help. I mean, on those items, it will bring in some extra money, but I doubt it's going to bring in enough to build transform social care. Um, you know, it will run very hard to stand still on some of these. Uh, Business tax agreements, but international uh, cooperation certainly helps. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so back to the room for any final couple of questions. Could we have the microphone over here, please? Hi, <clears throat> can you hear me? Thank you very much. I'm Godfrey Barhin. I'm currently a principal social worker in a local authority. So <laughs> I'm very familiar with some of the issues which have been discussed, but I wanted to pick up something about the workforce, obviously. Um, and Michelle, your point about care workers, I think we all fall into the trap of thinking that those you know, the workforce is usually low skilled and we don't talk about a highly skilled end. And the ascent to which we need to ensure that it's much more responsive to the labor market prices in general. But central government seems to use um, uh, it, it seems to use the workforce as a means of controlling almost public expenditure. If you think our, our pay are held below the rate of um, um, growth, wage growth in the economy in general, and just just wondered whether you could say something about that. <laughs> Hi, so I'm doing a master's at LSE and I also work in strategy for the NHS. Um, and I had a question more about social care in relation to the NHS. So we have a consistent narrative in the NHS that if we invested more in social care, then we go a long way to addressing some of the capacity issues in hospitals. So, for example, the hospital I work in now has a whole ward which essentially operates as a mini care home for patients who are ready to be discharged. Um, but over the last decade, we've seen that the NHS really comparatively has been well funded compared to other parts of the public sector um, and social care has been underfunded. So I wondered if there's any way that you think we could sort of improve social care funding by linking it closer to NHS funding and the NHS more generally. 
Thank you very much indeed. Um, so questions about the workforce, high skilled workforce uh, and uh, wages and wage restraint, perhaps, as it's sometimes called, uh, and questions about NHS and uh, social care integration um, and uh, whether those may uh, suggest a way forward. Um, Nick, would you like to start on with those? Yeah, I mean, on social care workers and the social care labour market, what I've written down is a, fr a phrase that I have unashamedly stolen from Inu Shafi, where she talked about stackable credentials. And I think stackable credentials that are transferable, you can move to another job, you've got your record, you can show it, is an important part of it. Clearly, pay and a pay structure that reflects those credentials is, is another part of it. Um, on um, social care in relation to the NHS, I mean, this relates to my point about not obsessing tunnel vision on a particular problem. Very often, I mean, the whole point about ambulances queuing up is not to do what the government is doing and saying, well, we've solved the problem, we're going to spend more on ambulances. It's the real blockage is the other end. And a strategic view would recognize that and target resources accordingly. Andrew, would you like to? So on the, on the workforce briefly, um, so why does it work better in the NHS? Well, because the NHS is a monolithic public service and we've decided to create career structures within it. Social care is not that at all. It is uh, roughly half financed by the state, but it's entirely provided by a highly distributed private sector. And many of the consumers are self-funders. And for those self-funders, buying social care is like being in a shop with no prices. Because although you know how much you're going to spend per week or per month with your current intensity of need, you have no idea how many weeks or months this will go on for. So you don't know what the bill is. And simple economics tells you if you don't know what the bill is, you will try to find the cheapest thing that's available. And so for all but the top one or two percent of the income and wealth distribution, buying social care is about trying to buy the cheapest thing that's available. And that is terrible for the labor force because it means that almost all of the supply is being delivered by people to people who want to pay the lowest they possibly can. So there's no, there's no benefit to innovation or investment as a provider, and that is terrible for the workforce. So we either, to, for the workforce to be looked after properly, we either need to nationalise the whole lot, which is simply not going to happen, or we need to make the market work. And making the market work is what the dealing with the catastrophic cost thing is about. Once you've dealt with the catastrophic cost, you move from maybe one or two percent of the population being able to be active consumers to maybe 30, 40, 50 percent of the population being able to be active consumers, and then you get innovation and investment. Now, people might prefer it to be an entirely nationalized industry, but it isn't, and it's not going to become that. It's not going that direction anywhere in the world. So we're going to make the market work. On links between social care and health, I I have had meetings with several Secretaries of State for Health and Social Care who said in terms. I know I should be asking for more money for social care, but if I ask for more money for social care, I risk not getting what I need for the, for the health service, and the health service is lexicographically senior to social care. So uh, if there is a way of linking the two together, and it may be that this new tax with the name of both in it will do that, then we'd be much better off because, yes, we've got lots of hospitals with people who shouldn't be in there who are in there because of social care failings. The only thing I say is in the long run, if we had fewer of them, that wouldn't save the NHS or the country money because they'd live longer and quite possibly at, at, at the end of life be even more expensive. Uh, and we have to always remember the reason we do health and social care is to give people fruitful lives, not to save money. It's the job of the Treasury to raise all the money and then we can more spend it. That's, that's what you like, isn't it? Nick? <laughs> uh, can I come in on the integration point? Can I ask you to you know, hold, hold your thought? Yeah. I'm going to come back to all the members of the panel for some final okay. reflections, but I just want to get the last poll in. And then, um, so don't forget what you're going to say, but um, if we could launch the poll again um, to just to see whether um, opinion has shifted during the course of the um, discussion today. Um, and I'd like to invite those in the room here also now to cast your vote. So the main way to finance improvements in adult social care should be through increasing. Raise your hand if you think it should be through national insurance contributions. Mm -hmm. About 19, roughly speaking. Uh, income tax, please. Mm, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. Uh, inheritance tax. 
one, I think, well done. Um, other taxes, which might include carbon tax, wealth tax, et cetera, et cetera. One, thank you. Uh, private insurance, no support uh, in the room. Um, and anybody who's changed their mind and now having heard the discussion thinks that fin uh, improvements don't need financing at all. Luckily not. Well, uh, that, that's a relief. Okay, so um, it looks as though um, that's a, a pretty consistent picture from our online audience and from here in the room um, with an, uh, a, an increase in support uh, for uh, national insurance contributions during the course of our debate this evening. That started out as the second or even third most popular option, but has now moved up to the top of your list of preferences with income tax falling a little behind uh, and perhaps slightly less support for, for uh, inheritance tax and other tax, little, little change in, in support for those during the course of the event. So thank you. Um, uh, thank you for, for, your, for your input. Thank you for your participation on the, on the poll. Um, whether you meant to or not, panel, you seem to have persuaded people that national insurance contributions are uh, or some people that, that national insurance contributions are, are a good way to, to finance improvements in social care. Um, but I'd like to invite you now to offer any final brief uh, reflections to, to close. So, Michelle, come back to you. Well, I'll just come back on the, the integration question, which is very much top of the agenda at the moment. So I think things have really moved on this during the pandemic because people were forced to work together. And every system I go out to, by which I mean the health and care system, I'm seeing real bottom-up enthusiasm for making that work and for finding ways to cut across the, the silos that, that, that are created by the, the way in which everyone is set up. So I think it's really hard, but I think, I think we can, there's, there's sort of some grounds for optimism there. Um, more down my sort of overall reflection, I just, you know, it's been a really, really fascinating debate. I suppose, you know, we, we, we feel a great sense of uh, hope in a sense uh, within uh, government because we, we've got the money and we've got this big vision. And I suppose the question I ask myself listening to all of this is if we're here and, you know, we've got three years worth of money and some huge ambitions through that. The question I ask myself is if we're here in four years time, will the debate be any different? I fear not. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Andrew? So I have two reflections. One is how wonderful it is to see this group of people, and particularly many young people, because I think this risks becoming an old people's issue and it really isn't. And the second thing related to that is I think the structural, I and mean, there are levels of funding issues that are significant, but the structural issue that we simply haven't faced in the UK yet is working age adults. And I fear that working age adults with social care needs are even more invisible than older people with social care needs, and that's something to keep pressing on about, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nick? Um, I think my conclusion from this is that your taxes are going to be rising. <laughs> so, um, you're going to have to accept that and live with it. But in the end, um, i come back to my opening point. We need to um, get the economy moving, because that is one way of squaring the circle. Thank you. If people think of this as an insurance thing, they're buying an insurance policy, they feel less bad about it than they would about tax. And it may have different incentive effects, it may. Um, so I think that's one point. Second point, the tax base matters. I've argued it should include the income of older people. Um, on that's the first point. Second point, back to strategy. We've heard about the NHS and social care. Don't just obsess on a narrow bit. And finally, what's all this about? We've heard brief mention about the agency of older people. Um, as my mother once put it, it's about living, not breathing. And therefore, quality of life really matters. And that's really what we're trying to achieve. And as I say, raising the money is relatively straightforward. It's, it's Michelle and her colleagues who have the difficult task. And, people like you who actually have to make it work in practice and you know all power to you thank, thank you very much well if we've whetted your appetite and you want to delve deeper into issues around uh, social care you can find more resources on the center for analysis of social exclusion website where we've got a briefing for example on inequalities in social care 
by myself and Nick Brimblecombe. You could also look at the School of Public Policy blog where um, Nick has written on the question of financing. You can, of course, look at uh, Andrew Dilnot's commission and its report, as well as more recent things that he's written, uh, and indeed uh, Nick McPherson also, uh, for example, in the Financial Times last uh, autumn when the government announcement came out. And you can read all about what Michelle is in charge of and um, delivering in the Department for Health and Social Care as well. Um, thank you very much to uh, Nick, to Carolina, to Irene for helping to organise the event today. Thank you very much to my panellists, Michelle Dyson, Andrew Dilnot, Nicholas McPherson, Nicholas Barr. Thank you very much to the audience here in the room and to you online for your uh, participation. Uh, and I hope that even if we haven't exactly solved the problems of adult social care this evening, we have contributed between us to a more enlightened public debate. Thank you very much.